Welcome back! Happy Friday to you. We're here. We made it. Welcome back to the Funk 530 Combat Footage Show. I said it right that time. I'm Ronnie. I'll be your host. Do me a favor. Tap on the like button. Drop in the chat. Let me know where you guys are chiming in from. It's always cool. We're all over the globe. But here we go. Welcome back! Where you guys at? Atlanta. Welcome in Miami. New Jersey, Jersey Shore. You guys know each other? Pennsylvania, Minnesota. Bangkok. No, no thanks. Oh, you mean like the city? Oh, okay. Yeah. Still probably pass. Uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. I see you. Western Montana. What's going on? Delaware, Connecticut, South Jersey. Goodness, we are everywhere. You guys look nice. Tonight too. I'm I'm in uniform. I've got my got my Hawaiian shirt on, tucked into my silkies. You know, you know, work attire is important. Where's my mouse? Oh, here it is. Bolivia, welcome in Okinawa. What's going on, guys? We got quite a bit we're going to talk about tonight. I want to give you guys a heads up. You know, right out of the gate for the stream tonight, we've got some um, some war that we're going to review. Um. Some of us might or could be tough to watch, depending upon the perspective that or the lens that you uh, look at it in. We're also going to talk a little bit about some hot topics right now, pretty much right out of the gate, not least being the conclusion of the NATO summit and some of the outcomes of that, um, but also some of the uh, information to come out of the White House, notably deployments, sort of, and stuff along those lines. And we're kind of going to just jump right into that. Because, you know, I've, I've been reached out to a couple times, uh, asked to provide a little bit of clarity or insight or even just opinion on the announcement from the White House relative to 3,000 members of the Individual Ready Reserve, or the IRR, along with the Selected Reserve. Uh, so essentially your TPU soldiers, things along those lines. Now, the memes to this are absolutely hilarious, right? Uh, you know, back in the surge days of the global war on terror, uh, we, were act we were reactivating our IRR troops, uh, which is essentially a status that you can sit in for quite some time. You're just not reporting anywhere. You're just, uh, you're able to be recalled. And they were very unhappy about that because they were being recalled to deploy. Well, the specific context of the authorization here from President Joe Biden is that they would um, recall IRR and selected reserve to active duty in support of Atlantic Resolve. Now, Atlantic Resolve, that's something, that's the key element here. Atlantic Resolve is a very large exercise that takes place in Eastern Europe. It's something that has been ongoing since 2014, largely in response to Russian aggression. Uh, as essentially or effectively a show of force. And what, it, what it's really there for is to coordinate, to teach um, you know, various NATO countries and NATO, NATO allies to coordinate and communicate effectively were they to you know, have to do it for real. We have been doing that, like I mentioned, since 2014. Now, the biggest question that most people have relative to why 3,000 additional IRR and selected reserve troops would be called up is ultimately and quite simply explained by the fact that it happens every year, <laughs> to be to be wholly honest. Um, but it's also important to understand the role that the reserves plays. I, I, I happen to know a little bit about that. The reserve element primarily consists of the an overwhelming bulk of the U.S. military's combat support functions. So you have your combat, your combat arms functions, things like infantry, mortarmen, um, your artillery, those, those functions that are actively employed in combat. Then you have your combat support functions, things like logistics, ordnance, um, administrative functions. Those functions are actually overwhelmingly aligned against the reserves. So anytime you have uh, a major undertaking, such as Atlantic Resolve, uh, or really just about any deployment for that matter, in order to have those administrivia type functions, right? In order to ensure that you're getting beans and bullets to your training grounds, you're going to need to recall 
the element that has the overwhelming majority of soldiers aligned against those functions, which is the reserve. Now, there's another element to this, which is being you know, tied to or correlated along with the recruiting woes. Um, that may or may not have played a factor in the total amount of troops that they, that they chose to pull. Uh, the United States presence in Eastern Europe is probably the largest been in, it's been in a very long time. And I, I would expect Atlantic Resolve to be quite a large undertaking this year. So all of those things could have played into the decision to activate a certain amount, right? So, you know, the 3,000, those would have been, or that would have been a part of the decision-making process there. But the decision itself to activate them is to be wholly honest, just not anything new. Now, what makes this necessary from, uh, at least uh, I'm looking at this from a non-expert perspective, just this is, this is where an opinion comes in and a little bit of research would be necessary for me to do this. It has to do with authorities. What makes this necessary for Biden to put out a statement like this is they are not being activated in support of any contingency or war. They are being activated involuntarily to support an exercise. That's why he has to express his authority to do so via statement. So that's something that, um, you know, folks had reached out to me on Twitter. Uh, I've got DMs about it. Can you provide a little bit of clarity or at a minimum, your thoughts? Now, just like with everything, I could be entirely off base with this. Uh, and it could be 100% because of recruiting woes, um, though historical precedent would lead me to believe otherwise. So that's what I wanted to cover on that. Now, quickly, I want to highlight for those that aren't really tracking the takeaways from the NATO summit. The NATO summit took place uh, from 11 to 12 July, just this, just during this week. There were a couple key takeaways from that. You know, first, and, and we talked about a few of them on Monday, some ex expectations that we had. First and foremost, obviously, being the element that a lot of folks are going to want to hear about is Ukraine. I've got some notes over here so that I don't miss anything. Uh, the NATO Secretary General uh, effectively reaffirmed that Ukraine does have a, a destination of NATO. It seemed as though many pro-Ukrainian uh, media sources, uh, personalities were expecting some form of an action plan. I, I shouldn't say action plan because there is a formal action plan uh, to be a part of NATO. We'll get to that in just a second. But some form of a pathway outside of a reaffirmation for Ukraine to to join NATO. The challenge, of course, that comes along with that, were NATO to join, or excuse me, were Ukraine to join NATO now, effectively what you would see is an immediate uh, activation of Article 5, which, you know, attack against one is an attack against all. NATO can't do that, right? So the biggest, the biggest catalyst for Ukraine to join NATO still and remains the end of the war in Ukraine, the end of Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Another couple of key notes here, though, uh, that we don't truly have a whole lot of details about. NATO and the G7 summit announced some level of security assistance guarantees for Ukraine. What exactly those guarantees are and when they take effect, I don't think many people have a strong understanding of. At least I don't. It's something that I intend to research a little bit further. And it's, again, they also reiterated that it's a matter of when, not necessarily if, Ukraine joins NATO. Uh, there were also several packages announced from several allies. Germany announced a package that's going to include new martyr vehicles, uh, along with additional Patriot launchers. There was some misinformation floating around that Germany was going to be providing additional Patriot batteries. That's not necessarily the case. The, Germany will be providing additional launchers. Now, a battery consists of kind of a control vehicle and a series of launchers. These launchers would either replace uh, or uh, I think a better word for it would be enable, you know, current batteries uh, that are already employed or, you know, potentially used to replace any that get damaged. Thus far, if I understand correctly, which again, I could be off on it, uh, Ukraine has not yet lost a Patriot battery. One was damaged not too long ago in Kyiv, but has since been re been repaired. Um, the last note that I wanted to talk about is certain member states have signed an agreement for the official provision of F-16s. Now, this is something that the majority of the information to come out of the NATO summit has been primarily, like I mentioned, reaffirmation of things that we already knew. 
things that were already rumint, uh, rumor intelligence. So the affirmation of these member states to provide Ukraine F-16s does not have any kind of timeline around it. We know that the United States is currently or has already stood up training programs for Ukrainian pilots uh, for the F-16s. Um, but that one is notable, especially given the, the formality of, of it being at the NATO summit. So those are the things I wanted to talk about right out of the gate here, making sure folks were A, understanding the, the ordering of the selected reserve uh, and the inactive ready reserve to active duty status in support of Atlantic Resolve, as well as talk a little bit about some of the high points from the NATO summit. I'm going to turn the music back on here. We have a whole bunch of renewals that came in. Welcome back. It's Friday. We're going to be jumping right into the footage here in just a second. Uh, Nicholas, thank you very much for the 17 months. Steve for seven months. Wonder9, Steve. And Kieran, thank you very much for the seven months. I appreciate you guys. Tim, thank you for 17 months. Holy crap, dude. How many babies is that? That's at least... That's a lot. That's a lot, lot of time. Welcome back. Uh, Robert, thanks again for that $5 as well. Appreciate you. Let's jump into the footage here. We're going to be starting with our map just like normal. And we've got some pretty heavy hitter footage that we're going to get to once we get through the map. Oh, I didn't. Speaking of maps, I, I told you guys, this is all off the cuff. I've got a list of topics to talk about here, but most of it's just in my head movies. The membership action plan, the NATO summit discussion. That was confirmed as something that will be skipped for Ukraine's membership in NATO. Again, the membership action plan is typically something that's put in place uh, for folks to modernize their forces, to allow them to integrate directly with NATO forces. And in my mind, one of the reasons that they probably are going to forego the membership action plan is the sheer amount of training that U Ukraine is being provided by NATO members. Um, if you're interested as an aside on what that training exactly looks like. Um, on my personal Twitter account, I actually transcribed an in-person account of the 47th Assault Brigade, Brigade training with U.S. forces in Germany. It's actually really insightful and interesting. I have quite a few takeaways from that um, in a lot of directions. So if that's something that you're interested in, that's on my personal Twitter account. I think I shared it with the Funker account as well. But Ukraine is trained so deeply with NATO at this point and has been provided so much NATO equipment that um, interconnectivity, uh, communication, and um, you know, being absorbed as a part of NATO wouldn't necessarily take as long as it normally would. That's kind of a, a guess for me, um, but it would be my best guess. So let's move on. Let's move to our campaign map. We're going to go to Deep State. Get the map pulled up here. All right, we're going to be starting in here, son. Here we go. We're actually going to start right here on Cherkesky. Shirk I don't know, Cherkesky Island. Right around this area, we're going to see some small Ukrainian soft boat raids, boat stuff. We're going to be watching boat stuff from Ukraine. If uh, I understand unit layout correctly, this would probably probably be the 73rd. Now, the 73rd is a unit that I've been tracking for a while. They uh, are oftentimes referred to as kind of, I shouldn't say an equivalent, but they're referred to alongside SEALs, if you will. There was a really, really widespread video that was released not too long ago of person Ukrainian personnel clearing out a trench at some extremely close distances. If I understand the deployment layout, the combat power layout for Ukraine, this would be the same unit. Video is coming up for you guys now. I do not have a translation, but I'll keep it on. Ukraine 
який переміщувався в місце розміщення свого спостережного пункту. Завдяки дрону вдалося побачити навіть, що вони переносили якийсь предмет. І, ймовірно, це був окопний реп або антидронова рушниця. Після зв'язок із засобами повітряної розвідки значно погіршився. Більше даних дістати не вдалося, але цієї інформації виявилося достатньо, щоб планувати наступний етап визвольної операції. Тож один із підрозділів 73-го морського центру спеціального призначення отримав завдання здійснити висування в район острову та провести спеціальні дії з метою знищення особового складу супротивника та подальшого взяття під контроль визначеної території. Операцію спланували в кілька етапів. Висування в район виконання завдання на острів групи здійснили в темний час доби двома човнами. З настанням світанку спецназівці висунулися вже в район проведення вогневого нальоту. Всі дії воїнів ССО координувалися зі штабу та супроводжувалися екіпажем безпілотного авіаційного комплексу, без якого результат запланованої операції був би повністю іншим. Було прийнято рішення не відкривати вогонь самостійно, а чекати ініціації вогневого контакту від супротивника, щоб візуально визначити місця розташування живої сили та спостережних пунктів окупантів. При наближенні першого човна на відстань до 100 метрів... І в цей момент другий човен ССО здійснює маневр і також відкриває вогонь у відповідь. За час перестрілки українським спецпризначенцям довелося скоротити відстань до ворога до 15-20 метрів. Це дозволило успішно здійснювати ураження зі стрілецького та важкого озброєння, що було в комплектації човна. Так вдалося ліквідувати двох російських військовослужбовців та одного поранити. Щоб не ризикувати далі власним життям, група здійснила маневр на відхід і вступила в фазу очікування. Екіпаж БПК починає свою частину операції. За допомогою безпілотника вони виявили... I'm going to turn this down and field a couple of those questions. I see, I see a comment there, no one is there. So what the beginning of the video was positing is that it was effectively showing us Russian infantry in that position. за принципом аватару. Оператору FPV-дрону вдалося вразити один з човнів противника. Пошкодження змусило його зупинитись і чекати, поки прийде інший човен, щоб відбуксувати його в місце евакуації. Darth Saint, yeah, we're tracking it. We're working on it. Appreciate you uh, letting us know. Внаслідок застосування FPV-дронів було знищено один човен, ще один пошкоджено, вбито одного військовослужбовця та поранено ще чотирьох. Так, завдяки інноваційним технологіям, вдається здійснювати спеціальні операції та зберігати життя нашим воїнам. Добре, давайте зберігати це знову. Знову ж таки, це тут. Знову ж таки, знову ж таки, знову ж таки, знову ж таки, знову ж таки. Right. These are these are areas that we've talked about before. We've seen other footage of Ukrainians as you know they gain ground further and further towards Oleshki. But there is also footage, uh, Russian produced footage from here at Antonovsky that we're going to be shifting to it in you know right now. Now, one of the questions that I had not too long ago, because you kind of stopped hearing about it after we watched some pretty intense footage of, you know, a BTR recover. We saw BTR recovery, excuse me. We saw footage of, um, you know, armored vehicles that for some reason made their way onto, it was actually this bridge down here. But you haven't heard a whole lot about the Ukrainian elements that have been making that crossing, uh, doing boat stuff. Russians continue to strike those areas, which is at least somewhat indicative of Ukraine still holding ground on that side of Antonovsky. This is Thermite, so the 9M22S fired by the Grads, magnesium-based in Often, oftentimes con confused or misrepresented as phosphorus.
But there's, we also have some footage here of artillery strikes in the same area. So it looks like Ukraine still has some level of a foothold down near Antonovsky. Uh, potato drone coming up. As with always, guys, all of the footage that we're watching tonight on the stream, uh, at least to, under most circumstances, to about a 99, 99th percentile, it's going to be in the stream description. So check the stream description um, if you guys would like to go back and find the sources of these videos. Not all of them are on the website. Uh, we try to get as much of them up as possible. Um, we're typically faster on the draw to get them out on Twitter these days. I've been running our Twitter uh, and trying to interact as much there as possible. So some of this stuff is going to be taken from our Twitter. Some of it's going to be taken from uh, our website. Recommend following both. Let's jump back to the campaign map because we're going to shift on our map over towards Piatihatki. Piatihatki and Zaporzhia. Let's pull out from the map here. And I haven't done this in a couple streams, so I figured I'd go ahead and reorient everybody to the colors on the map that we're using. First of all, we're using Deep State Map. Um, I actually, I, I like Deep State Map. I wish I had some modicum of understanding of a layout of Ukrainian forces, but you can get that from a map on militaryland.net. I like this one because it's a little bit easier for me to go back in time. I can go back in time and review how the forward line of troops changes, and it does change in both directions. From a color perspective, green is liberated territory for Ukraine. Uh, green meaning that it was liberated outside of the past two weeks. Blue has been liberated inside of the last two weeks. So this is ground taken inside of the last two weeks. Your gray areas here in between the red, red obviously being Russian-held territory, your gray areas are going to ultimately be... Um, kind of contested areas or unknown areas. Right? We're going to be starting right here in Piatihatki. Now the fight for Zherebyanki continues. We're going to see a couple videos from this area. We're actually going to see Ukrainians as they attempt to assault Zherebyanki, only to re begin receiving indirect fire, uh, kind of turn around and unass that impact area back towards Piatihatki. But first, we're going to see the explosion of a... Russian ammo depot. If I'm not mistaken, that takes place down here, a little bit to the southeast. Video is coming up for you guys now. Here you are. Keeping the sound off on this one. Awesome shirt, brother. Thanks very much, man. All right, let's bring it back up. Got another one here. Coming up for you now. All still in that area of um, Piatihatki, and event as an eventuality, we'll move a little bit closer towards uh, Zherebyanki. This one takes place actually in Piatihatki, though. And more specifically, this is Russian artillery shelling Ukrainian infantry. Has anyone else watched Agent Zelensky by Scott Ritter? Absolutely not. I, w I won't be watching anything from Scott Ritter.
Why won't you watch Scott Ritter? I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you straight up. Likes masturbating to 15 year olds. There's documented evidence of that. Not a fan. Let's move on though. Now between the two, between Piatti Hotki and Sheriff Bianchi, like I mentioned, Ukrainians tried to assault. But what ended up happening? What had happened was. Russians have that single road dialed in pretty effectively. All of my screens are jumping around. Stand by. This, this has been happening to me lately. Better wait for it. There it is. And we're coming back. Thanks for your patience, guys. Video's coming up for you now. This is uh, what starts as an assault, uh, but ends as a withdrawal from the impact area. Those on the ground here are Ukrainian. Це хуйово. Лягай. Ой-ой. Та сука заїбав ти вже. Let's bring it back up. So, once again, that was... Those were Ukrainians as they attempted to assault Jerebyanki. I've got one more video from the area. I'm going to show you guys the map again just for those that might be uh, rejoining us. Those were Ukrainians here along this stretch of highway attempting to assault Jerebyanki from Piatihatki. At the beginning of the video, they are moving towards it. And at the end, if I understand the video correctly, they are moving away from it. One thing I do know for certain is it is geolocated to be in this location. Now, the next one that I have, though, is Ukrainian artillery in the area is also working. Bring that up. This is Ukrainian artillery working uh, to the immediate southeast of Piatihatki. Specifically and obviously uh, against Russian infantry.
What happened to the website, folks? We're aware of the issue. Not really sure what's going on with it. Uh, devs are devs are working on it, though. Sorry, guys. Uh, I mean, it's still working from a certain perspective for me. Uh, so it seems to be maybe a device-specific problem or a browser-specific problem. But we are aware of it, and we're trying to see what we can do about it. Uh, let's shift on our map here. We're going to be... It, it might very well impact the stream at some point here. I've got some of our site links in here as well. Uh, let's shift on the map, though. Kind of keep driving. We're going to be shifting to the right. Near Robotin. Here. Now, one of the one of the topics, one of the one of the very heavy topics. I'm going to put myself back up over here. That has been talked about is mine clearance. You see the question a lot. Why isn't Ukraine using mine clearance? You know, why are they just kind of hammering? You know full on into minefields and you know i'll say this until i'm blue in the face it looking at this objectively just from a footage perspective they absolutely are but where i start to have questions is how much mine clearance they have now if you needed evidence of mine clearance we're gonna be watching that right now this is what i believe is a leopard i'm not a not a tank guy what i believe is a leopard clearing mines in and around uh, that Robotin axis. That shirt crashed the site. Everyone wants one. Head over to Savage Tacticians. We've got our own version of this shirt coming out soon. It is not my birthday. Once again. Now you'll note, at the front of that, there is a mine roller attachment on it. Does he drive over it? How does he clear it? He drives over it and it, it makes it go off. But it's the rollers that does that, which keeps the mine away from the vehicle itself. Now, to give you a little bit closer of a view of a mine roller, this is somewhere in Zaporizhia, if I'm not mistaken, but this will actually give you an up-close look of what a mine roller does when you have it employed on the front of your vehicle. Coming up now. Those are anti-personnel. Those small, those small explosions there. Those are probably PFM ones, the little butterfly bastards. This larger explosion is more than likely um, anti-tank. There. And then these smaller explosions, likely anti-personnel. Let's bring it up. Don't touch with your knee. Actually, a great uh, an interesting story was published today about the medic that jumped out of the back of the Bradley in an attempt to recover his comrades. His knee lands on, um, you know, some form of uh, anti-personnel mine and it amputates his leg from the knee down. Uh, he applies his own tourniquet. Well, he survives. And uh, there's imagery of him um, smiling with his significant other now. So I thought that one was interesting. All right, let's 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 shift, though. We're going to be moving to Makarivka. Just further along the forward line of troops. From west to east, still. Load, please. Thank you. I'll give you a quick zoom out so you can see where in Ukraine we are. We're in, you know, the southeast here. When we shift into Makarivka... That's where we, uh, if I'm not mistaken, actually, that might be 
back over here, shifting from um, between the Oblasts. So Makarivka is where we're headed next. This is actually footage that we've already seen, technically. So you guys have actually already seen this fight. But one of the purposes of this show is to try and show you guys all of the new footage that's coming out. Some of the stuff we're going to see tonight happened, maybe in late June, if you will, but these are new perspectives. So this fight specifically is the Ukrainian 35th Marines on a mechanized infantry assault. And what's most interesting to me about this is they're doing this assault in parallel with a Russian tank. This is a new perspective from the opposite angle. We're going to see the old perspective that you're already familiar with, just to recap, right after this one. Video's coming up now. I don't know if this is copywritten, so I'm going to turn the music off. Copyrighted? Copywritten? I get yelled at whichever way I say that. Now you have to watch closely here because what you're going to see is you're going to see these MRAPs. Um, you know, these vehicles dismount Ukrainian infantry. And then Ukrainian infantry is going to charge these trenches here. This, if I understand the original video correctly, is a Russian tank. This YouTuber know nothing warfare. Correct. Always trying to learn, though. So you see that infantry dismount. Oh, well, we didn't. There must be a longer version. In the longer version, which I don't, which I don't have here, uh, there is actually a Leroy Jenkins moment. Uh, I'll see if maybe Cam. Uh, I'll, I'll shoot a message to Cam while we're watching the next one here, and see if he can't uh, shoot that one over to me. It's, what what we end up seeing is we actually see infantry dismount those vehicles. We see them push uh, into those trenches, and it's all really kicked off. The catalyst is one dude. He just takes off running in his in his team or his squad. It'd be, it'd be between a team and squad level size element. Just follows after him. Let's watch this um, other perspective that you guys have already seen just to help you go back, if you will, to the original footage that I showed you. It would have been about three weeks ago. Here you go.
All right, I'm back. I went to go and try and find uh, that longer version of the footage, and I wasn't able to. Sorry, guys. I'll be recapping the specific footage that we're watching here in just a second. This is an older perspective. This specific video is an older perspective of a, a bit of footage that was just released, or at least just put out into uh, the environment, as far as I could tell, uh, during this past week. You're watching the 35th um, Marine Brigade assaulting, it's a full mechanized assault, Russian positions near... Makarivka. Now, this fight would have taken place a couple weeks ago, but again, we are a footage-focused team, so documenting this stuff, watching it, even if it is just a new perspective, we'll see this again in a little bit, a new perspective of a fight that had already taken place. We are archivist. We are not a news team. I try to give you guys stuff as, uh, you know, as soon as it comes out. You know, I try and give you some current uh, as much as possible, but ultimately the mission is to archive it. So we're going back to the map here, just so you can see where we are in Ukraine. So we're here in Makarivka. And we're going to be shifting to the right towards Novodonetsk. One of the things that I love about Deep State, not that, is you can search for city names. Dude. Not that one. That one. So this is where we're going to be with our next bit of footage. You're going to see Ukrainian Max Pros attempting to assault, uh, approach Novodonetsk, but one of them is going to hit a mine in the process of trying to do that. Video is coming up for you guys now. See those Max Pros up here? Right at the front. One more time. All right, now let's bring it up. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys where we're headed to next. And first and foremost, this next part of the stream, this next video that we're going to watch uh, is the video that I gave you a discretion about a, a discretion advisory about when I started the stream tonight. It depends upon your perspective of what we're about to watch. Um, it's It can be, it's going to be, it could be difficult. Let's just put it that way. We're going to be moving to the Vladar area of the map. I'll show you guys that here on the map in a second. But I'm going to describe this video ahead of time. Then we're going to watch it. And then we're going to come back up. And we're going to shift out of me just providing the factual context that's known and shift into a little bit of opinion. Now, if, you want, if you'd rather read this opinion than hear it said out loud, you can just go to our Bunker Twitter. I actually wrote a you know good long little article as a part of a thread. Um, but... The, fo the footage, the video specifically, that you're going to watch, appears to be and was reported by the Gray Zone. The Gray Zone is a known affiliation with Wagner, Wagner PMC from Russia. It was reported by the Gray Zone and is purported to be a Ukrainian reconnaissance element. Now, this reconnaissance element is moving along one of, according to the gray zone, the only unmined roads in this area. Area specifically is undefined. At one point, they dismount from their vehicle. Their vehicle pulls off into the trees, and they continue on foot 
holding some level of, you know, a formation, if you will, almost like a patrol is what it appears we're looking at. At one point, a couple of them look behind and they break off into the woods. That's when a, what appears to be, civilian vehicle shows up. Why a civilian vehicle is out there in the middle of nowhere, I'm not entirely certain. Uh, that's context that we wouldn't have without being there. But the Ukrainian team then, by definition, ambushes that vehicle. Um, at least one Ukrainian can be seen firing through the windshield, and the video posits that two civilians in the process of that ambush are killed. We're going to watch the video. I'm going to orient you on the map to where exactly it is purported to take place, and then I'll give you a few thoughts on it. So let's head back to the map. I'll show you Vuladar. There you are. So we're very close to where we just were. We've got Novodonetsk here. We got Vuladar and Pavlivka. This is reported to take place somewhere near Vuladar. Reported to take place. Let's bring it back up. Let's watch the video. Discretion advised. And I'll give you some direct thoughts at the end of it. It's about six minutes long. So it, it's it's got some length to it. Here you are. Context, that is a Ukrainian produced armored vehicle. These are Ukrainians. You have to look very, very closely, but well, these are reported to be Ukrainians. You have to look very closely because uh, they are wearing blue tape around their helmets. I'm going to keep the music off on this one. A little bit of a jump cut there.
All right, let's chat for a second. So, for those that might be new to the stream, because, you know, something to keep in mind is, is not only on the website, but here the, we get all kinds of metrics. One of those metrics is n new visitors. It's actually comprised of about 50% of those that watch this show are new to the community, new to the stream. Something that I somewhat make, in, make a habit of is regardless of who produces it, if it, if it, if it feels fake, if it looks fake, I'm going to say it. I'm, I'm going to say it, right? Producing things like this, uh, not necessarily video, but, you know, creating propaganda was a job for me. Like, I did that, like, for a living with the U.S. military. There are some key things to always remember when you are watching what feels looks and smells like propaganda. You always have to kind of put yourself into the shoes of the target audiences. What would this make me believe? If I am the target of, of this, what we would call observable, what would I gain or lose from it? What would the produ producer gain or lose from it? There are four kinds of folks that are going to see this video. First and foremost, there is the camp that is going to see war in its truest form. They'll believe probably that this is real, that this footage is real. They'll believe that this is a reality and one of the reasons that war itself is the crime. Right? They answer to some of the questions that people would have, like, why is a civilian there at on the front well the front is their back is their backyard then you'll have people that claim that it's fake right? so that was our first group of folks then you'll have people that claim that it's fake let's talk about some of the things that they're going to point out specifically one of the things that stands out to me i'll tell you where i where i stand in all of these four groups of people here in a moment one of the things that stands out to me is the artillery The saturation here, the coloring of the artillery doesn't make sense. It almost looked at, it almost looks like an image that I would have created in Canva or in Photoshop that I have overlaid over another video. If we turn this on slow motion, it just sticks out as though it's not supposed to be there. Understanding that explosions aren't supposed to be there in the first place. That's one of the things that sticks out to me. The second that sticks out to me is what this vehicle, quite honestly, understanding that the entirety of the Ukrainian front is a Ukrainian's backyard, what is this vehicle doing in this field specifically? Are they going out there to, I don't know, smoke some weed? I don't understand, I don't understand why this vehicle is there. That stands out to me. One of the last things is, what is this team doing? Why did they dismount their vehicle? And continue just walking down this road. Has the vehicle, has the video been geolocated? No. That's going to be... A talking point. That's one of the things that I've listed here. It, it would be really difficult to geolocate this video. Extremely difficult. But I don't understand why, they're, why their vehicle pulled off and they continued. The last thing is less about the video, and more about how it was reported. The last thing in the camp of those that would believe this video is fake. The sheer amount of detail as to how we are reviewing it, how we are seeing it, that Gray Zone provided was actually quite interesting. You ever get in, you ever have a conversation with somebody and you know that they're kind of lying to you? And you know that because they're giving you details that you didn't ask for? According to Gray Zone, this video was published 
was recorded by a counter-sabotage drone that had been following this reconnaissance team for quite some time. And they gave us additional fidelity and detail that we just, that was just, how do you know that? Why do you know that? Now, the, the, the actual layout of the initial source reporting is in the website, is on our website, Funker530.com, in our post that we have there. There was just an amount of detail there that was a little sus. Now, there's a third type. And that is folks that believe that this video, to be wholly honest with you, and let's go back to it for a second so I can explain, is real, and they're here to armchair quarterback it. So we're still in the first camp, but it's we're more into the armchair quarterback. So that first camp is all about, you know, war is war. War is reality. Right? And this camp would be, be more the type of folk that would say this was purposeful, the purposeful targeting of civilians. For that, I'd like to take you guys back to Iraq. One of the things Will's, Will posits in his write-up is since... The beginning of war, civilian casualties have been a reality of it. You always try to mitigate civilian casualties to a certain perspective, or to a certain extent, I should say. But I don't know that there has ever been any war that civilian casualties have been entirely eliminated. In fact, in some instances, non-combatant casualties are actively pursued either in the pursuit of fear or in genocide. Now there's a fourth camp that would be watching this, and that is the, I have no f***ing idea what I'm looking at here. That's probably about where I sit. Here are some of the reasons that I think that this video is real. First and foremost, this vehicle's moving. Right? In order for them to fake this vehicle moving, they would have had to have set up some kind of a remote control device. Right? This would this would need to be a remote controlled vehicle, especially if the guy in the front is already dead. Right? So if this was staged, theoretically they wouldn't have a living dude in the front and somebody else in the back seat. So first and foremost, this vehicle's moving. Why it's moving in the location it is, I have no idea. That's kind of why I'm still in the park of the fourth type of people. When they begin to fire on the vehicle, here's your Ukrainian team here. There are clear impacts on the glass. And I'm going to give you the reasons that I think it's both real and the reasons I think it's not real. These are the reasons that I think it could be real. You have impacts on the glass here. Those don't look faked to me. In fact, the impact areas, the point of impact, stays the same. The body language afterwards of our troops on the ground, after they pull them out of the vehicle, they begin to administer what I would assume is med. This guy specifically, you can see him reaching into his kit. He's being told something by the other guy. He's going to gesture away in my brain, and I'm filling this in with absolutely zero context outside of this two-dimensional lens that we're looking at here. In my brain, he's saying something akin to, WTF, I'm trying to save this person. This would also be, if this were real, for the camp that believes this was purposeful, an indicator that it was not. The last thing is the artillery. The artillery is both an indicator of why I believe it to be fake, as well as why I believe it to be real. It's really just this frame that looks so out of place. Here. It just looks out of place to me. But, if this artillery is real, Understanding the circular error probable of artillery. 
if Russia is actually firing artillery at a group of actors, that artillery has a CEP that could theoretically hit those ac actors. Now, this could be very much so explained by some type of a controlled detonation if, in fact, the explosion is real. The one that gets to me the most, though, is actually the second detonation. Let me try and find it for you. Right here. Again, it just looks out of place. Can we confirm that? No, absolutely not. Not even in the slightest. And this isn't me trying to play the middle ground. This is me actively trying to see if what we're looking at here is a death of civilians, which is a reality of war. It, it's a harsh reality, but it is one. We have the footage of the, what, is it, what, what was it, a BTR? A Ukrainian civilian vehicle pulling up to an intersection. BTR opens up on them. That one's a little bit more clear. Kind of, kind of difficult to fake that one. The Russian BTR opens up on them. But, the, but with this one, it's a little bit more unclear. There are indicators for both uh, it being fake or staged. Fake is a, a difficult word. Staged. There are also indicators of it being real. So I'm in that fourth group. I have no idea what I'm looking at here. I have, for those that have been following our work for, for a while, I have called out Ukrainian fake footage. I have called out Russian fake footage. And to hold... To hold... Ukraine or Russia accountable in a negative context for creating or using that capability from an information warfare perspective is ignorant because ultimately this goes all the way back. I'm going to be that guy and I'm going to quote Sun Tzu. What did he say? All deception, all warfare is deception. All deception is warfare. Something, something along those lines. Deception will be a part of war forever. So, not using that capability would be doing yourself a disservice. Where the lines start to get really blurry, though, is how rapidly you can, you can reach your target audience. You can reach a global target audience now by just dropping a fake, a fake staged video into Telegram, into a, a known commodity where millions of OSINT accounts, millions at this point, with the hopes of just doing good and sharing data, are going to propagate that globally. So not doing that, if this, if this is staged and fake, would be leaving a capability on the table. Whether you're Ukrainian or you're Russian, that's an opinion of mine. But this isn't one of those videos we could not talk about. There are question marks surrounding it. Uh, the clarity of it is... One of the things that makes me believe that it very well could be real, especially the historical precedent of civilians, non-combatants being killed in war. That's just a personal take of mine. We don't have we have very little context outside of the footage itself. All right, but let's move on. It is available for you guys on the website. I'm going to go ahead and drop that link if you'd like to read. The Gray Zones report how they originally released that. Follow that link. We're still in Vuladar, though. We haven't moved. Got a little long-winded on that one. We're going to see follow-up footage. Now, on Monday, I want to say it was Monday, we watched footage of a Ukrainian assault team being dropped off by a BTR and immediately take contact. Well, we have some continuation footage of that, and I might have showed this to you guys on Monday. I might have showed it to you, but I couldn't quite remember, so we're going to watch it again. This is that team um, being recovered by that BTR and battling with Soviet-era doors. Yeah, 
Schuss nach. Time out, guys. Hold on, hold on, hold on. My system did that weird thing again, and I can't confirm that you guys are still seeing what I want you to see. All right. Here we go. The battle with the door. 2023 colorized. I'm going to back up. Imagine, imagine trying to climb into this piece of shit. It's like you're trying to climb in through a manhole. All right, let's bring it back up. We're still around the area of Ulidar. Though this would technically be Pavlik Pavlivka, excuse me. This one is a little bit more contextual. A little bit less combat in this one, more just a Russian drone filming some Ukrainian infantry. That one's coming up for you guys now. Now, going back to our uh, vehicle, or excuse me, our footage from Vuladar. I want to pass you guys directly to the longer write-up. I want to explain my thoughts a little bit more concisely. This is fake. Yeah. I knew that one was going to stir up a lot of discussion. All right, let's bring it up. Uh, for those that might have a weak stomach, I have to warn you, this next one is uh, not gory. It's just extremely disorienting. But what we're going to see here is uh, our Ukrainian strikes from a thermal perspective, though the drone operator, a lot of, lot of, lot of movement. So there's your discretion on this one. Same area, Pavlivka. How many of y'all turned your head?
All right, let's bring it back up. We're going to be shifting again. Pervomysk. Get that pulled up on the map. Here we are. Pretty big shift there. And I skipped over one in Marinka, but we'll go back to it. We're going to see an assault attempt. Presumably what they're potentially calling out here with this arrow. That gets stopped by Ukrainian artillery. It's kind of a compilation of videos coming up now. I'll be checking in on the support right after this footage. Haven't checked in on that in a bit. All right, come back up. Uh, let's shift back to Marinka quickly. Screens are all doing it again. What ends up happening is my primary screen that you guys see goes black, right? And then it all shifts. Let's go to Marinka. We're back. you are so I skipped a little bit too far for too far north here skipped over Marinka just missed it we're gonna see Russian artillery targeting or excuse me Ukrainian artillery targeting Russian troops in a, if, what is effectively rubble Coming up now. Uh, actually, before we get there, before before I just continue to drive on. Baby Draco, thank you for the $10. Love the work, Ronnie. Send thanks to you and the rest of the team. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Covert Design, thank you for the $5. I hate to be that guy, but what's the shirt company, the shirt you're wearing? I can't remember at all. This is Savage Tacticians. We've got our own version of uh, our new line of merch coming from them very soon. We're working on finalizing designs now. In fact, we're going to have one of these. And it may or may not be in Woodland camo. Pretty excited about that. Crab Cat, thank you for the $10. Ronnie, I have a very important question. How many cans can a cannibal nibble if a cannibal can nibble cans? No idea. Um, at least two, though. Love the streams and happy birthday. Not my birthday. Thanks very much for the 10. Rad Doctor, thank you for the 10. JMC, thank you for the 656. Have you seen the footage Civ Div has been uploading? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, we, we follow along with his published footage. Uh, and Lance, thank you for the 345. Back to the footage. We're in Marinka. Well, what was Marinka? And Ukrainian artillery targeting Russian troops.
Are those Russians? Yes. Yes, they are. Right, let's bring it up. We're going to be shifting towards Bakhmut here. Actually, a really intense video. That technically, this is another one of those instances where you have already seen a part of this. We're going to be, we're going to be watching the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade uh, in that southern flank of Bakhmut here. Let's go back to the map. The 3rd Separate Assault Brigade has been primarily near Klashivka of late, with the 28th a little bit further to the south. Now we're on those outskirts of Bakhmut. Although this fight took place probably sometime in late June, the full version of the fight was just released. And it's coming up for you now. Discretion is advised here. Now I say, I say that because, um, you know, at one point in this video, uh, you're going to see BM-21 grad uh, land, uh, like, on somebody, uh, on a Ukrainian. You're also going to see um, some casualties inside of the vehicle at the end. So I want to make sure that I give you guys a discretion as often as possible, right? That's the balance. How do we continue to show this stuff to you, show you the reality, um, whilst not normalizing it? Video's coming up. Біля драбини дивіться щось. Я гранату кину. Давай, давай, давай. Азимут, Азимут, перевод огня трохи далі, далі трошки, акуратно. Что там есть что-то? Ну там разгрузка лежала и каска и всякая хуйня. Детройт, Детройт, нас накрыли. Откатываемся дальше, наверное. Да, так что делаем? А, сука. Да, так, Галочина 300, я 300. Давай, Гал, нормально? Да. Давай, братан, а, сука. Сука. А, блядь. Братан, я точно не уверен, но так уебало в боку. Давай. Цинкуй, открывай. Все нормально, нормально, нормально. Пулик сзади, сзади пулик. Да, да. Все нормально, все нормально. Я стою, блядь. Все хорошо. All right, let's bring it up. Uh, so I saw some questions while we were watching that. Is that an artillery or is it mine? That was more than likely, which we only have the video as context, grad, BM-21 grad fire. It's that uh, antiquated looking truck with a bunch of tubes on the back of it. Fires rockets. Um, grad fire is devastating, if yet somewhat difficult to 
actually aim at anything. But from an area perspective, it's pretty indiscriminate. Just rains hell. So that was the uh, third assault brigade on the southern flank of Bakhmut. There's more footage from Bakhmut. It's a lot of FPV drone strikes. And in fact, you know, there's quite a bit of FPV drone video and footage all throughout this forward line. Uh, we post uh, quite a bit of that to the website, but we're going to be skipping over that from just a brevity perspective. There's just that much of it that gets produced and published from both perspectives. Uh, both Russia and Ukraine really actively using FPV drones uh, to great effect as well. You know, there were a lot of folks that wondered the effectiveness of an RPG strapped to, you know, one of those little racing drones for four or $500. Uh, it's actually quite effective. But we're going to jump up to Dubrova in Luhansk. I guess it's in Donetsk. It's actually here. What you guys are going to see with this one is actually really interesting footage. This is going to be a ZU-23-2, which is... Stand by. I got to pull it up. Talk amongst yourselves. Something like one in four men have performance issues. It's not something I'm proud of. Just hadn't processed this one all the way. Nope, nope, nope. Almost there. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. All right. So, what you guys are going to see here is a ZU-23-2. It's a 23-millimeter uh, anti-aircraft gun. It's up up there, you know, near Dub Dubrova in that, along that Kramina Svetova line. It's being used against Ukrainian positions. This is Russian perspective footage. Yes, that is an anti-air gun. I see the question there. If you're wondering what the cyclic rate of that is, it's 2,000. Uh, now, there's a second fire rate that's listed, which is a practical fire rate, uh, which is 400 rounds per minute. So that is bursts, if you will. But when you open it wide up, it is about 2,000 rounds a minute of 23 millimeter. In fact, terrifying. Put yourself on the other end of that as it impacts the trees around you, sends all that secondary fragmentation. Let's come back up. We're going to be shifting once more up into Russia, actually. We're going to be headed to Kozinka. Belgorod. Near Belgorod, I should say. Stand by. Struggling with my map today. Let's 
going to be up here. In this area. What you guys are going to see is a partisan unit known as the Brotherhood Battalion attacking into Russia. It's a very short distance. It's kind of a checkpoint, if you will. Some pretty wild footage. I wanted to make sure and show it to you. It did not, in fact, take place in 2008. It's actually very recent. Wow. Пацаны, АТ-шку! Now, I see a whole lot of questions about uh, the blur. That's not something that we added. That's something that's already in the footage. Uh, and the intent would, you know, obviously be for some level of OPSEC, operation security. This has been geolocated to be inside of Russia, though. So, from a certain perspective, it only worked for so long. <laughs> All right, let's bring it up. So that's what I have for the mapped footage. Now, I've got a couple videos here that I want to show you guys. I hope you're wearing your brown pants. That I don't have a great location in Ukraine for. This first one is uh, POV footage, not that kind. Well, here you go. It's an anti-tank guided missile. Uh, you're looking at, if I recall correctly, uh, a static camera, a Ukrainian camera that's been set up, you know, from an observation perspective. All right. Got one more. This is what it looks like as a drone. when a Russian surface-to-air system tries to shoot you down. Oof. Missed it by that much. All right. Let's bring it up couple more videos for you. These are, again, this is somewhere in Ukraine. Don't have a great uh, understanding of where. Some of them can be geolocated, but I wasn't able to find a geolocation for them. But this next one, uh, discretion advised on this one. You're going to see 
more POV footage. This is helmet cam footage of Ukrainians driving a non-tactical vehicle, and they're going to hit a mine. They all survive. All right, let's bring it up. I need to check in on the support, guys, and thank you very much for it. Uh, it's been an interesting discussion kind of night. Lance, thank you very much for becoming a member. Welcome to the Funkers, dude. Appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. Marat, thank you for the 1526. I love the objective coverage. Keep up the good work. I do my best. We all do. The whole team does. And we just appreciate you guys being here very much. Thanks again for the 1526. Uh, Malachi, thank you for the $50. Love the analysis and the jobs you do. The comment section is still a shit show. <laughs> uh, but I suppose you can only do so much. Keep up the great work. Something that, uh, you know, I'll pull the curtain back for a second. Something that we're working on. One of the things that we don't, we like discourse to just happen. Uh, we like the discussions to happen. We like the differing perspectives. But one of the things that we want to uh, afford you guys the opportunity to do is effectively make it a place that you want to comment in. So uh, one of the features that we're hoping to roll out at some point, I don't know exactly when that's going to be because it's still being developed. The comment system is uh, very custom built for 530. Uh, is potentially hide other commenters. Now it's not going to hide them entirely, um, at least not in the current iteration or what we expect. I don't know when this is coming and Funker's probably going to be pissed that I'm talking about it, but it's something that folks have been asking for for a while. So you think of troll commenters, things along those lines. Uh, the hide will essentially just dump them to the bottom for your view of the comments. Um, thanks very much for the 50, man. Sly, thank you for gifting five Funker memberships, man. Holy crap. DC Williams, thank you for the hundred dollars, dude. Learn something new every day. You all at Funker have worked your butts off and deserve it. Thank you very much for that, man. Thank you guys all for just being here, being a part of the discussion, right? It's not always perfect. Uh, the app's not perfect. Our team aren't, is not perfect. You know, we as individuals have our have our biases. We are human beings, but we do try as best as possible to just document as much footage as we can. Um, thank you again for all of the support tonight. That's going to close out the stream. I do have one more video for you, and I'd like to remind you all as sincerely as I can that mortar tubes are absolutely not toys. So please don't let children around mortar tubes. I appreciate you. Thanks for being here. We'll see you guys Monday, 6 o'clock, right back here, uh, for essentially a recap of all the footage we found over the weekend. Stay informed. <laughs> Not once, but twice. <laughs> <laughs> There's a saying we have in Tennessee. Fool me once. Shame on me. Fool me twice. Good night.